Welcome to another edition of AFR EMS Case Studies. My name is Chris Ortiz. I'm the EMS Division Chief for Albuquerque Fire Rescue. And today I'm joined by our Medical Director, Dr. Kimberly Pruitt. Hi, Chief. And we're also joined by Rescue 15 Lieutenant Tiffany Johnson. I'm at Rescue 11 now. Rescue 11 now, but our case today is it's talking fun. about Rescue 15. That's right. Well, thank you again for joining us. We really appreciate um, having you here. You so Rescue 15, um, Engine 15, and I'll take it back. We're going to discuss a cardiac arrest case that was also an ECMO candidate. Yeah. Um, and you all were dispatched to a local gym for a patient in cardiac arrest. This is true. Um, you've been doing this for a long time, um, do a fantastic job, but I'm sure when you get that dispatch, you're still thinking about the things, um, pre-arrival kind of going through your head. What, let us know about what your checklist looks like before you get there. Sure. Um, to be completely honest with you, it's been several years since I've actually been in the 15th district, um, since I was actually driving. Um, and so my first thought was the location of this individual. Um, it used to be an old liquor store. And so a lot of my things came about of, you know, what kind of demographics this patient might have, where were we going to find him? Was he going to be outside? Was he going to be inside this, this store? Um, and so some of the things that I think about in terms of individuals in cardiac arrest are obviously our ECMO criteria. So is this patient going to be um, an ECMO candidate? That's one of our big things now. Um, and then I I take in consideration, obviously, what my role is going to be on this scene, whether I show up first or if I'm showing up, you know, in, in like, a simultaneous with an AES unit, et cetera. Um, it's kind of what my role is going to be on this kind of call. So, Awesome. So for this call, you guys arrived to that gym, um, and it sounds like you found a 51-year-old male uh, that was on the ground, unconscious, not responsive. That's correct. And it sounds like the staff at the gym did a great job of attending to him um, immediately and then activated 911. What did you guys see when you got there? Yeah, so um, when we showed up, we realized it was a gym, um, and we had a couple of the patrons that were outside. They were directing us inside, and then the staff at the front desk actually kind of pointed us a little bit more towards where the patient was at. Um, when we noticed the individual, he was on the floor um, out kind of in front of a, a squat rack is what I would describe it as. Um, and they had, he had multiple staff members around him. And the first thing that I happened to notice was that he had an AED on him. So, um, and the staff member kind of caught my attention and said, you know, we've been, he, he said that, or one of our patrons had said that he collapsed after he had finished one of his sets. Um, they came over to him, tried to wake him up. He wouldn't wake up. They came and grabbed us, um, and we came over here and started CPR. Um, we have that AED the device, and so we came over and put it on him, and it told us um, to clear the patient and because it was going to shock him. So we just did what it said, um, and it, it, it said that it was going to shock him twice. So it actually shocked him twice. And, um, and then he said that they didn't do CPR because they um, it looked like he had been breathing. So... Mm. That's where we were met with the, how their treatment started to where we then started our treatment. Interesting. Great job by those folks, the early recognition, uh, starting the hands-only CPR, and then getting that AED. It's textbook, and we ask all, um, all lay persons to do who aren't in the uniform to, to be able to provide care. So now take us to where you, where you guys take over care. How did the patient present? What did you see as far as your findings? So um, first thing I like to do is I like to kind of guess, obviously I don't know this individual, and so um, I try to guess his age to be able to, to rule out that um, ECMO criteria. Um, one of the big things that I do with ECMO is I, I try to rule out whether it's respiratory or, or overdose in nature to start. If I can rule those out, if it's not respiratory or presumed respiratory, presumed overdose in nature, then my flags are obviously more inclined to move to ECMO um, and kind of get things a little bit, rolling a little bit faster. So um, I identified him in his 50s, didn't really know too much about him, couldn't, I couldn't tell you his, his, his history whatsoever, but um, he obviously was at the gym. He was potentially in good health, so um, he didn't presume to have any kind of skin changes that would indicate um, sort of some liver issues. I didn't see any fistulas that would indicate any kind of renal issues. So I immediately jumped over into the inclusion criteria. So um, he had bystander CPR being performed. Um, his initial rhythm that we saw him in was a V-fib. Um, and his end title, I think, was 12 whenever we stepped into it. Um, and so just from those things, and obviously his age criteria being in the 50s-ish, um, those criteria keyed me into being a little bit more proactive about ECMO. So when I think of ECMO, 
I really try to to focus in on um, airway management. So I I want um, an, an ET tube if possible. Um, and this situation um, now, if I was with my generalized crew, um, we have kind of a a uh, an understanding of what the expectations are on these arrest scenes. And so um, they know that if I identify an ECMO criteria that I want myself or um, my rescue driver up at the airway managing the airway with an, an ET tube and then whoever's not managing that um, handling an, a humoral IO. So um, that also goes down the line. I mean, it starts from the airway and it moves all the way down into med administration, you know, to include our anti um, arrhythmics. So, um, with this patient, because I had a, a somewhat of a rogue kind of crew, um, I just let them run with what they were running with. And so we, we ended up trying to, so, um, we managed the airway with a BVM at that point. We were getting really good bad compliance. Um, we had dropped an NPA and that was still managing very well. Um, in that point, I wanted to be able to establish some sort of um, access and get at least Epi on board. Um, when we first identified that V-fib rhythm, we shocked him. Um, that was one of the first things that we saw was he's in V-fib, everyone move out of the way, let's continue with um, defibrillation. So we did. Then we established the IO. Then we moved into pulling Epi, and then we were drawing up lidocaine at that time um, while we were moving him to the gurney. Um, so once we got him on the gurney, this was a patient where we felt like um, field ECMO would be really appropriate for this, but they weren't on shift. And so we just said, you know what, we're within 10 minutes of the hospital, let's just go. So that's what we did on scene uh, for that patient. So for that initial um, defib that you guys did, was there any changes in the rhythm after that initial defib, or did you guys remain in VTA or uh, uh, SP, uh, Bfib? BFib. <laughs> yeah, we were we were in a refractory Bfib. So even after lidocaine, um, he was in Bfib. We actually got a few runs of VTAC to kind of present itself, and then as we actually arrived to the hospital, we were in polymorphic VTAC. So. Um, in route, we considered doing vector changes, um, kind of changing the paddles. Um, instead of having the normal placement of paddles, we were considering doing anterior, posterior. Um, and we were actually considering doing um, using AAS's monitor to have that defibrillation um, kind of responsibility. Um, there wasn't many hands in the back of that truck to be able to help with the active Lucas. Um, so instead, we we went down more of the medication route. We were thinking more of how can we stabilize uh, the cellular membrane in this patient. So we went. We were thinking maybe mag. So we were drawing up mag as we went into um, the hospital. How many shocks do you recall on that uh, during the transport? So from the time that we initiated, well, from the time that we made contact to the um, hospital doors, I believe we made six wow. additional shocks. Interesting. So docs, you brought up a, a great point in terms of um, thinking through the mag. So obviously the antiarrhythmics, they saw what they had with the V-fib, they uh, administered the defibrillation and then started the uh, lidocaine. And then um, we're working towards mag during transport. Tell us, tell us why MAG is so important. How early should we get that on board with these types of rhythms? I tend to think of MAG in a cardiac arrest about the time you did, where if you're two or three shocks into it at this point, you got off scene so quickly, which was totally the appropriate thing to do. Um, whenever I've got a V-fib arrest that we've shocked two or three times, I start to thinking about, okay, what can we change that may help? Because his heart's trying to survive. And so, like you mentioned, changing the vector sometimes is very um, effective, but it that wasn't logistically really an option for you right. in the back of the moving ambulance. So without that, um, MAG is always a great option, especially as you're moving more into the polymorphic VT right. um, with a rhythm that seems like it wants to change. I think sometimes MAG just gives it that little bit of extra push to, um, to come under control. And then, of course, along with, on, alongside with the antiarrhythmics, um, that kind, kind of trifecta for your refractory VFib patients. But of course, if refractory VFib, ECMO is probably the best, yeah. best thing. So the, what you can do best is get them moving towards the hospital or keep ECMO coming. Right. The other thing I wanted to mention is in route, we went for an airway. Um, I, I felt like it was really important to establish something a little bit more secure in terms of an airway. Um, when we had addressed the airway, we noticed that his, his jaw was trismus. So 
he's not a candidate for something more invasive like criking. Um, so we stuck with BVMing and we had some um, just some simple adjuncts. Um, an MPA, I believe, is what we had in his nose. And we were getting adequate ventilation. His his end title was, was maintaining. Um, it it was doing what it needed to do. The compressions from the Lucas device were were adequate enough to be able to keep that that peaked end title. Um, so we felt like it was efficient enough um, to be able to get him to somewhere where they could at least give him something to relax his jaw and then maintain his airway. Great job. We, we talk about that a lot with... Um with patients and being like from the least invasive to the most invasive, if what you're doing is already working and you can maintain that PLS airway, then just stick with it, right? So you guys did a fantastic job with that. Absolutely. So tell us what happens when you get to the hospital. Now you're at a point where you've um, defibrillated this individual almost six times, we said. Um, we still have that lethal rhythm. What happens when you get to the ED? So when we got to the ED, um, we obviously came into recess and um, from that point forward, they confirmed that he was an ECMO candidate, um, and we just kind of handed him over to them. I mean, they initiated ECMO right away. They were setting up for cath, doing the, the cath, and we just kind of stepped more out of their way than anything. But um, to them, it was extremely important, obviously, to have more information about the location of where he was found and kind of a little bit of history as to the arrest or what he was doing prior to the arrest. I remember being asked, um, well, what was he doing? Did anyone see him collapse? Um, things like that. I was being asked some questions that, you know, when we walk in and we give our turnover reports to the hospital, a lot of times we're very in depth with these things, you know, oh, he was in a car accident or, oh, he was, you know, he was found unresponsive. We don't know the downtime, but in this situation, his downtime was less than 15 minutes. They were really interested in knowing kind of like that sort of information about the scene. Um, and they, they were, you know, we told them, oh, we shocked him six times and it was kind of like, oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Um, but tell us more about the scene, you know? So I was kind of interested to, to hear about, you know, their, how they're wanting to know how we identified ECMO and, and kind of moving forward with ECMO criteria there. So. Excellent. I think in their head, they're probably working through the exact same checklist that you are as yeah. the arriving lieutenant. Is this respiratory or is it not? And so right. that like um, confirmation of the witness arrest, the AED use and yeah. everything else is helpful. But I think uh, they're thinking their checklist is the same as yours. So they were just yeah. confirming uh, no respiratory arrest. Right. And it... it the, the setup for this scene was almost perfect, right? It was the witness to arrest. It was the bystander CPR, the early AED, which gives them the highest likelihood of survival. Right. Um, you going through the checklist immediately upon arrival, knowing that pre-hospital ECMO is not available, but they still have the capabilities in the hospital, ran through that checklist and and got out of there as quick as you could, I think gave him his best chance. It was, it was literally the chain of events that led to a good outcome from what I understand, Doc. Do we have follow-up on this So patient? this gentleman, um, because of your quick recognition and excellent treatment, he ended up on ECMO for four days. Uh, he went to the cardiac cath lab and they found a uh, culprit lesion, they call it, in his right coronary artery, which they were able to put a stent in. Yeah. And um, this gentleman actually walked out of the hospital of his own accord, totally neurologically intact, several yeah. days later. So a huge save, right. huge save. Incredible yeah. job. Um, I think one of the things that we do talk about regularly is reminding folks, I think we've done a good job of educating people about pre-hospital ECMO, um, but in that we let it do the alarm room, know if it's available that day or if it's not, but just understanding and having everybody realize that just because pre-hospital ECMO isn't available, that we still have the capabilities both within UNM and uh, Presbyterian downtown and just keeping that in mind. And if you meet this criteria and you run through that checklist just like you did, you give them the best opportunity just to get them there. And I know it's it's typically not what we do, right? We usually set up shop and start doing our, our treatments there on scene, which I think is still appropriate for the most part. But I think early ones, you recognize that it's a candidate, get your early things done first, and then right. get going with them to get them that definitive care. Right. So. I think my mindset is um, on those scenes, if we're going to be waiting for a, a pre-hospital ECMO to come out anyway, what would I want done before they get here? You know, that's kind of my thing. I think about response times, you know, at 15th district, they're coming from threes. You know, how much time do I have to stabilize this arrest to get him ready for 
um, the ECMO truck if it's available. So I do tend to take that kind of preemptive time on scene to be able to prepare what could be a possible field ECMO. And I think that's what we kind of ran with at 15s too is, you know, that's why we wanted to try to establish an airway. That's why we wanted to get an IO on board and at least get some epi on board, start our, you know, getting our dysrhythmics pulled and ready to go. I, I think it's, it's important to kind of still be mindful that even in a, a field ECMO, you're going to have that response time from them that you could be doing things to kind of keep this arrest going um, to give this guy the, the best possible outcome that you can. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And you and your crew did. It's fantastic. I think we wanted to make an effort um, starting this year because we have these cases pretty regularly, but there's some that stand head and shoulders above others in the work that folks do. So getting people recognized for the great work that a lot of providers are doing out there. So for the inaugural session of this for 2024, you're going to get our first oh uh, life-saving <laughs> award. Uh, so it's a Thank challenge you. coin from the EMS division. Thank uh, you. And we'll share that with the rest of the crew as well. And we really do appreciate not only you coming to talk to us about it today, because I think it's helpful for all of our providers, but just for the care that you provide day in and day out, it's really appreciated. Thank you. I think one thing that I do want to kind of mention, and I know that both of you have heard it from, you know, my voice in terms of emails, but I think the one thing that really helped this guy that we don't really, we don't emphasize enough is that it, you know, we just kind of jumped into an already life-saving event. Um, I think the staff over at Republic really took some training um, and they took it and made it something that was active to be able to help save this man's life. And I think ultimately, I mean, we can give him all the meds and we can give him all the defibrillations and we can give him everything that we can in our, our toolbox to be able to help save his life. But I think ultimately the fast response of that staff, the bystander CPR they performed, acknowledging that he needed potentially an AED, putting the AED on him, listening to it, following its instructions not only once but twice, and defibrillating him. I think, honestly, they are the reason why he walked out of the ER this time. It, it had nothing to do with me. I just helped stabilize him en route on the way to the hospital. They were the ones that initiated the life-saving care. I just ran with it. Great point. Thank you to the staff at uh, Republic Gym for, for recognizing, identifying, and treating this patient. It was huge. I agree. It probably was the, the predominant piece in saving this man's life. So, so great work. Awesome. Yes. That's all we have for today's case. Uh, if anybody has any interesting cases I'd like to bring, we're asking you to use the SharePoint tab. We're begging folks to just give us some cool cases. If you're not as comfortable coming to talk about them, just give them to us and we'll, we'll talk them through for you. But it's not that scary, right? It's, just, it's not that scary. It's easy, yeah. So <laughs> come on down, talk with us about it, and until then, we'll see you next time. Thanks.